Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. Read by James Wilby. Mr. Phileas Fogg lived in 1872 at Number 7 Savile Row, Burlington Gardens, the house in which Sheridan died in 1814. He was one of the most noticeable members of the Reform Club, though he seemed always to avoid attracting attention, an enigmatical personage about whom little was known except that he was a polished man of the world. Certainly an Englishman, it was more doubtful whether Phileas Fogg was a Londoner. He was never seen at the bank nor in the counting rooms of the city. He had never been entered at any of the inns of court, either at the Temple or Lincoln's Inn or Gray's Inn, nor had his voice ever resounded in the Court of Chancery or in the Exchequer or the Queen's Bench or the Ecclesiastical Courts. He belonged to none of the numerous societies which swarm in the English capital, from the harmonic to that of the entomologists, founded mainly for the purpose of abolishing pernicious insects. Phileas Fogg was a member of the Reform, and that was all. Was Phileas Fogg rich? Undoubtedly, but those who knew him best could not imagine how he had made his fortune, and Mr. Fogg was the last person to whom to apply for the information. He was not lavish, nor, on the contrary, avaricious. His daily habits were quite open to observation, but whatever he did was so exactly the same thing that he'd always done before that the wits of the curious were fairly puzzled. Had he travelled? It was likely, for no one seemed to know the world more familiarly. He often corrected with a few clear words the thousand conjectures advanced by members of the club. He must have travelled everywhere, at least in the spirit. It was at least certain, however, that Phileas Fogg had not absented himself from London for many years. Those who were honoured by a better acquaintance with him than the rest declared that nobody could pretend to have ever seen him anywhere else. His sole pastimes were reading the papers and playing whist. Phileas Fogg was not known to have either wife or children, which may happen to the most honest people, either relatives or near friends, which is certainly more unusual. He lived alone in his house in Savile Row, whither none penetrated. A single domestic sufficed to serve him. He breakfasted and dined at the club at hours mathematically fixed in the same room at the same table. He passed ten hours out of the twenty-four in Savile Row, either in sleeping or making his toilet. When he chose to take a walk, it was with a regular step in the entrance hall with its mosaic flooring, or in the circular gallery with its dome, supported by twenty red porphyry ionic columns, and illumined by blue painted windows. When he breakfasted or dined, all the resources of the club, its kitchen and pantries, its buttery and dairy, aided to crowd his table with their most succulent stores. If to live in this style is to be eccentric, it must be confessed that there is something good in eccentricity. The mansion in Savile Row, though not sumptuous, was exceedingly comfortable. The habits of its occupant were such as to demand but little from the sole domestic, but Phileas Fogg required him to be almost superhumanly prompt and regular. On this very 2nd of October, he had dismissed a certain James Forster because that luckless youth had brought him shaving water at 84 degrees Fahrenheit instead of 86. And he was awaiting his successor, who was due at the house between 11 and half past. At exactly half past 11, Mr. Fogg would, according to his daily habit, quit Savile Row and repair to the reform. A rap at this moment sounded on the door of the cosy apartment where Phileas Fogg was seated and James Forster, the dismissed servant, appeared. New servant, he said. A young man of thirty advanced and bowed. You are a Frenchman, I believe, asked Phileas Fogg. And your name is John? Jean, if monsieur pleases, replied the newcomer. Jean Passepartout, a surname which has clung to me because I have a natural aptness for going out of one business into another. I believe I'm honest, monsieur. But to be outspoken, I've had several trades. I've been an itinerant singer, then a circus rider when I used to vault like Lyotard and dance on a rope like Blonde. <laughs> then I got to be a professor of gymnastics so as to make better use of my talents. And then I was a sergeant farmer at Paris, 
and assisted at many a big fire. But uh, I quitted France five years ago and wishing to taste the sweets of domestic life took service as a valet here in England. Finding myself out of place and hearing that Monsieur Phileas Fogg was the most exact and settled gentleman in the United Kingdom, I have come to Monsieur in the hope of living with him a tranquil life and forgetting even the name of Passepartout. Passepartout suits me, responded Mr. Fogg. You are well recommended to me. I hear a good report of you. You know my conditions? Uh, yes, monsieur. Good. What time is it? Twenty-two minutes after eleven, returned Passepartout, drawing an enormous silver watch from the depths of his pocket. You are too slow, said Mr. Fogg. Pardon, monsieur, it is impossible. You are four minutes too slow. No matter. It's enough to mention the error. Now, from this moment, 26 minutes after 11 a.m. this Wednesday, October the 2nd, you are in my service. Phileas Fogg got up, took his hat in his left hand, put it on his head with an automatic motion, and went off without a word. Faith, muttered Passepartout, somewhat flurried, I've seen people at Madame Tussauds as lovely as my new master. Madame Tussauds' people, let it be said, are of wax. During his brief interview with Mr. Fogg, Passepartout had been carefully observing him. He appeared to be a man about forty years of age, with fine, handsome features and a tall, well-shaped figure. His hair and whiskers were light, his forehead compact and unwrinkled, his face rather pale, his teeth magnificent. Phileas Fogg was indeed exactitude personified. As for Passepartout, he was a true Parisian of Paris, and an honest fellow with a pleasant face, lips a trifle protruding, soft-mannered and serviceable, with a good round head such as one likes to see on the shoulders of a friend. His eyes were blue, his complexion rubicund, his figure almost portly and well-built, his body muscular. It would be rash to predict how Passepartout's lively nature would agree with Mr. Fogg. It was impossible to tell whether the new servant would turn out as absolutely methodical as his master required. Experience alone could solve the question. He presented himself and was accepted, as has been seen. At half-past eleven, then, Passepartout found himself alone in the house in Savile Row. He began its inspection without delay, scouring it from cellar to garret. So clean, well-arranged, solemn a mansion pleased him. Hung over a clock in Mr. Fogg's bedchamber was a card which, upon inspection, proved to be a program of the daily routine of the house. It comprised all that was required of the servant, from eight in the morning, exactly at which hour Phileas Fogg rose, till half-past eleven, when he left the house for the reform club. All the details of service, the tea and toast at twenty-three minutes past eight, the shaving water at thirty-seven minutes past nine, and the toilet at twenty minutes before ten. Everything was then regulated and foreseen that was to be done from half-past eleven a.m. till midnight, the hour at which the methodical gentleman retired. Having scrutinised the house from top to bottom, Passepartout rubbed his hands. A broad smile overspread his features, and he said joyfully, Ah, this is just what I wanted. Ah, we shall get on together, Mr. Fogg and I. What a domestic and regular gentleman! Phileas Fogg, having shut the door of his house at half-past eleven, and having put his right foot before his left five hundred and seventy-five times, and his left foot before his right five hundred and seventy-six times, reached the Reform Club, an imposing edifice in Pall Mall. He repaired at once to the dining room, and took his place at the habitual table, the cover of which had already been laid for him. He rose at thirteen minutes to one, and directed his steps towards the large hall, a sumptuous apartment adorned with lavishly framed paintings. A flunkey handed him an uncut times. The perusal of this paper absorbed Phileas Fogg until a quarter before four, whilst the standard, his next task, occupied him till the dinner hour. Dinner passed as breakfast had done, and Mr. Fogg reappeared in the reading room and sat down to the Pall Mall at twenty minutes before six. Half an hour later, Several members of the reform came in and drew up to the fireplace. They were Mr. Fogg's usual partners at whist. Andrew Stewart, an engineer. 
John Sullivan and Samuel Fallentin, bankers, Thomas Flanagan, a brewer, and Gautier Ralph, one of the directors of the Bank of England, all rich and highly respectable personages, even in a club which comprises the princes of English trade and finance. Well, Ralph, said Thomas Flanagan, what about the robbery? Oh, replied Stuart, the bank will lose the money. On the contrary, broke in Ralph, I hope we may put our hands on the robber. Skillful detectives have been sent to all the principal ports of America and the continent, and <laughs> he'll be a clever fellow if he slips through their fingers. But have you got the robber's description? asked Stuart. In the first place, he's no robber at all, returned Ralph positively. What? <laughs> a fellow who makes over fifty-five thousand pounds? No robber? No. Oh, perhaps he's a manufacturer, then. <laughs> the Daily Telegraph says that he is a gentleman. It was Phileas Fogg, whose head now emerged from behind his newspapers, who made this remark. He bowed to his friends and entered into the conversation. The affair which formed its subject and which was town talk had occurred three days before at the Bank of England. A package of banknotes to the value of £55,000 had been taken from the principal cashier's table. Let it be observed that the Bank of England reposes a touching confidence in the honesty of the public. There are neither guards nor gratings to protect its treasures. The package of notes not being found when five o'clock sounded from the ponderous clock in the drawing office, the amount was passed to the account of profit and loss. As soon as the robbery was discovered, picked detectives hastened off to Liverpool, Glasgow, Havre, Suez, Brundisi, New York and other ports, inspired by the proffered reward of £2,000 and 5% on the sum that might be recovered. There were real grounds for supposing, as the Daily Telegraph said, that the thief did not belong to a professional band, however. On the day of the robbery, a well-dressed gentleman of polished manners and with a well-to-do air had been observed going to and fro in the paying room, where the crime was committed. A description of him was easily procured and sent to the detectives. I maintain, said Stuart, that the chances are in favour of the thief, who must be a shrewd fellow. Well, but where can he fly to? asked Ralph. No country is safe for him. <laughs> where could he go then? Oh, I don't know that. The world is big enough. It was once, said Phileas Fogg in a low tone. Cut, sir, he added, handing the cards to Thomas Flanagan. What do you mean by once? Has the world grown smaller? Stuart inquired. Certainly returned Ralph. I agree with Mr. Fogg. The world has grown smaller, since a man can now go round it ten times more quickly than a hundred years ago. And that is why the search for this thief will be the more likely to succeed. And also why the thief can get away more easily. Be as good as to play, Mr. Stewart, said Phileas Fogg. But the incredulous Stewart was not convinced, and when the hand was finished, said eagerly, You have a strange way, Ralph, of proving that the world has grown smaller. So, because you can go round it in three months? In eighty days, interrupted Phileas Fogg. That is true, gentlemen, added John Sullivan. Only eighty days now that the section between Rothal and Allahabad on the Great Indian Peninsula Railway has been opened. Here is the estimate made by the Daily Telegraph. From London to Suez via Montseny and Brindisi by rail and steamboats, seven days. From Suez to Bombay by steamer... Thirteen days. From Bombay to Calcutta by rail, three days. From Calcutta to Hong Kong by steamer, thirteen days. From Hong Kong to Yokohama, Japan by steamer, six days. From Yokohama to San Francisco by steamer, twenty-two days. From San Francisco to New York by rail, seven days. From New York to London by steamer and rail, nine days. Total, eighty days. Yes, in eighty days! exclaimed Stuart, who in his excitement made a false deal. But that doesn't take into account bad weather, contrary winds, shipwrecks, railway accidents, and so on. All included, calmly retorted Fogg, adding as he threw down the cards, two trumps. Stuart, whose turn it was to deal, gathered the cards up and went on. Well, you are right, theoretically, Mr. Fogg, but practically... Practically also, Mr. Stuart. <laughs> I'd like to see you do it in eighty days. It depends on you. 
Shall we go? Heaven preserve me! <laughs> Not I! But I would wager four thousand pounds that such a journey made under these conditions is impossible. Quite possible, on the contrary, returned Mr. Fogg. Well, make it then! The journey round the world in eighty days? Yes! I should like nothing better. When? At once. Only I warn you that I shall do it at your expense. It's absurd! cried Stuart, who was beginning to be annoyed at the persistency of his friend. Come, let's get on with the game. Deal over again, then, said Phileas Fogg. There's a false deal. Stuart took up the pack with a feverish hand, then suddenly put them down again. Well, Mr. Fogg, said he, it shall be so. I will wager the four thousand on it. Calm yourself, my, my, my dear Stuart, said Fallentin. It's, it's only a, a joke. When I say I'll wager, returned Stuart, I mean it. All right, said Mr. Fogg, and turning to the others, he continued, I have a deposit of twenty thousand at bearings, which I will willingly risk upon it. Twenty thousand pounds? cried Sullivan. Twenty thousand pounds, which you would lose by a single accidental delay? You are joking, stated Ralph. A true Englishman doesn't joke when he is talking about so serious a thing as a wager, replied Phileas Fogg solemnly. I will bet twenty thousand pounds against anyone who wishes that I will make the tour of the world in eighty days or less, in nineteen hundred and twenty hours, or a hundred and fifteen thousand two hundred minutes. Do you accept? We accept, replied Messrs. Stewart. Fallentin, Sullivan, Flanagan, and Ralph, after consulting each other. Good, said Mr. Fogg. The train leaves for Dover at a quarter before nine. I will take it. This very evening? asked Stuart. This very evening, returned Phileas Fogg. He took out and consulted a pocket almanac and added, As today is Wednesday, the 2nd of October, I shall be due in London in this very room of the Reform Club on Saturday, the 21st of December, at a quarter before 9 p.m. Having won twenty guineas at whist and taken leave of his friends, Phileas Fogg, at twenty-five minutes past seven, left the Reform Club. Passepartout, who had conscientiously studied the programme of his duties, was more than surprised to see his master guilty of the inexactness of appearing at this unaccustomed hour. Mr. Fogg repaired to his bedroom and called out, Passepartout! Passepartout did not reply. It could not be he who was called. It was not the right hour. Passepartout! repeated Mr. Fogg without raising his voice. Passepartout made his appearance. I have called you twice, observed his master. But it is not midnight responded the other, showing his watch. I know it. I don't blame you. We start for Dover and Calais in ten minutes. A puzzled grin overspread Passepartout's sound face. Clearly, he had not comprehended his master. Monsieur is going to leave home? Yes, returned Phileas Fogg. We are going round the world. Passepartout opened wide his eyes, raised his eyebrows, held up his hands, and seemed about to collapse, so overcome was he with stupefied astonishment. Round the world, he murmured. In eighty days, responded Mr. Fogg, so we haven't a moment to lose. But <laughs> the trunks, gasped Passepartout. We'll have no trunks, only a carpet bag, with two shirts and three pairs of stockings for me, and the same for you. Make haste. Passepartout tried to reply, but could not. Was his master a fool? No. Was this a joke, then? They were going to Dover. Good. To Calais. Good again. Perhaps they would go as far as Paris, and it would do his eyes good to see Paris once more. But surely a gentleman so chary of his steps would stop there. By eight o'clock, Passepartout had packed the modest carpet-bag containing the wardrobes of his master and himself. Then he carefully shut the door of his room and descended to Mr. Fogg. 
Mr. Fogg was quite ready. Under his arm might have been observed a red-bound copy of Bradshaw's Continental Railway Steam Transit and General Guide, with its timetables showing the arrival and departure of steamers and railways. You have forgotten nothing? asked he. Nothing, monsieur. My Macintosh and cloak. Here they are. Good. Take this carpet bag, handing it to Passepartout. Take good care of it, for there are twenty thousand pounds in it. Passepartout nearly dropped the bag, as if the twenty thousand pounds were in gold, and weighted him down. Master and man then descended. The street door was double locked, and at the end of Savile Row they took a cab and drove rapidly to Charing Cross. The cab stopped before the railway station at twenty minutes past eight. Two first-class tickets for Paris having been speedily purchased, Mr. Fogg was crossing the station to the train when he perceived his five friends of the reform. Well, gentlemen, I'm off, you see, and if you will examine my passport when I get back, you will be able to judge whether I've accomplished the journey agreed upon. Oh, that would be quite unnecessary, Mr. Fogg, said Ralph politely. We will trust your word as a gentleman of honour. You do not forget when you are due in London again, asked Stuart. In eighty days. On Saturday the 21st of December, 1872, at a quarter before 9 p.m. Goodbye, gentlemen. Phileas Fogg and his servant seated themselves in a first-class carriage at twenty minutes before nine. Five minutes later the whistle screamed, and the train slowly glided out of the station. The news of Phileas Fogg's bet spread through the Reform Club and afforded an exciting topic of conversation to its members. From the club it soon got into the papers throughout England. The boasted tour of the world was talked about, disputed, argued with. Not only the members of the Reform, but the general public made heavy wages for or against Phileas Fogg, who was set down in the betting books as if he were a racehorse. Bonds were issued. Some took sides with Phileas Fogg, but the large majority shook their heads and declared against him, and people in general began to think him a lunatic. At last a long article appeared on the 7th of October in the Bulletin of the Royal Geographical Society, which treated the question from every point of view and demonstrated the utter folly of the enterprise. Everything it said was against the travellers, every obstacle imposed alike by man and by nature. A miraculous agreement of the times of departure and arrival, which was impossible, was absolutely necessary to his success. The fog party dwindled more and more. Everybody was going against him, and the bet stood a hundred and fifty and two hundred to one. Lord Albemarle, an elderly paralytic gentleman, was now the only advocate of Phileas Fogg left. This noble lord who was fastened to his chair would have given his fortune to be able to make the tour of the world himself, if it took ten years, and he bet five thousand pounds on Phileas Fogg. But a week after Fogg's departure, an incident occurred which deprived him of any more potential backers at any price. The Commissioner of Police was sitting in his office at nine o'clock one evening, when the following telegraphic dispatch was put into his hands. Sue is to London. Rowan, Commissioner of Police, Scotland Yard. I've found the bank robber, Phileas Fogg. Send without delay warrant of arrest to Bombay. Fix, detective. The effect of this dispatch was instantaneous on both the police and, more importantly, the members of the Reform Club. The polished gentleman disappeared to give place to a bank robber. His photograph, which was hung with those of the rest of the members, was minutely examined. The mysterious habits of Phileas Fogg were recalled. His solitary ways, his sudden departure, and it seemed clear that, in undertaking a tour round the world on the pretext of a wager, he had had no other end in view than to elude the detectives and throw them off his track. The circumstances under which this telegraphic dispatch about Phileas Fogg was sent were as follows. The steamer, Mongolia, was due at 11 o'clock a.m. on Wednesday the 9th of October at Suez. 
The Mongolia plied regularly between Brindisi and Bombay via the Suez Canal. Two men were promenading up and down the Bombay wharves. One was the British consul at Suez. The other was a small, slight-built personage with a nervous, intelligent face and bright eyes peering out from under eyebrows which he was incessantly twitching. This was Fix, one of the detectives who had been dispatched from England in search of the bank robber. It was his task to narrowly watch every passenger who arrived at Suez. So you say, Consul, asked he for the twentieth time, that this steamer is never behind time? No, Mr Fix, replied the Consul. She was bespoken yesterday at Portside, and the rest of the way is of no account to such craft. I repeat that the Mongolia has been in advance of the time required by the company's regulations, and gained the prize awarded for excess of speed. Does she come directly from Brundisi? Directly from Brundisi. Have patience, Mr. Fix. But really, I don't see how, from the description that you have, you will be able to recognize your man even if he is on board the Mongolia. A man rather feels the presence of these fellows, Consul, than recognizes them. If my thief is on board, I'll answer for it, and he'll not slip through my fingers. I hope so, Mr. Fix, for it was a heavy robbery. A magnificent robbery, Consul. Fifty-five thousand pounds. Mr. Fix, said the Consul, I like your way of talking and hope you'll succeed, but the description which you have there has a singular resemblance to an honest man. Consul, remarked the detective dogmatically, great robbers always resemble honest folks. Little by little, the scene on the quay became more animated. Sailors of various nations, merchants, shipbrokers, porters, fellers, bustled to and fro as the arrival of the steamer was immediately expected. It was now half past ten. The steamer doesn't come, Fix exclaimed as the port clock struck. She can't be far off now, returned his companion, and with that observation the consul went away to his office. Fix, left alone, was more impatient than ever, having a presentiment that the robber was on board the Mongolia. But Fix's reflections were soon interrupted by a succession of sharp whistles, which announced the arrival of the Mongolia. The porters and fellers rushed down to the quay. Soon her gigantic hull appeared. She brought an unusual number of passengers, some of whom remained on deck to scan the picturesque panorama of the town of Suez, while the greater part disembarked in the boats and landed on the quay. Presently, one of the passengers, after vigorously pushing his way through the importunate crowd of porters, came up to Fix and politely asked if he could point out the English consulate, at the same time showing a passport which he wished to have visaed. Fix instinctively took the passport and with a rapid glance read the description of its bearer. An involuntary motion of surprise nearly escaped him, for the description in the passport was identical with that of the bank robber which he'd received from Scotland Yard. Is this your passport? asked he. No, it's uh, my master's, and your master is... He stayed on board, but he must go to the consul's in person, so as to establish his identity. Oh, is that necessary? Quite indispensable. Uh, and where is the consulate? There, on the corner of the square, said Fix, pointing to a house two hundred steps off. I'll go and fetch my master. He won't be much pleased, however, to be disturbed. The passenger bowed to Fix and returned to the steamer. The detective passed down the quay and rapidly made his way to the consul's office, where he was at once admitted to the presence of that official. Consul, said he without preamble, I have strong reasons for believing that my man is a passenger on the Mongolia. And he narrated what had just passed concerning the passport. Well, Mr Fix, replied the consul, I shall not be sorry to see the rascal's face, but perhaps he won't come here. If he is as shrewd as I think he is, consul, he will come. To have his passport visaed? Yes, but I hope you will not visa the passport. <laughs> Why not? If the passport is genuine, I've no right to refuse. Still, I must keep this man here until I can get a warrant to arrest him from London. Ah, well, that's your lookout, but I cannot... The consul did not finish his sentence, but as he spoke, a knock was heard at the door, and two strangers entered. You are Mr Phileas Fogg, said the consul after reading the passport. I am. And this man is your servant. He is a Frenchman named Passepartout. 
You are from London? Yes. And you are going to Bombay? Very good, sir. You know that a visa is useless and that no passport is required. I know it, sir, replied Phileas Fogg, but I wish to prove by your visa that I came by Suez. Oh, very well, sir. The consul proceeded to sign and date the passport, after which he added his official seal. Mr. Fogg paid the customary fee, coldly bowed, and went out, followed by his servant. Well, queried the detective. Well, he looks and acts like a perfectly honest man, replied the consul. Possibly, but that is not the question. Do you think, consul, that this phlegmatic gentleman resembles feature by feature the robber whose description I have received? Well, I concede that, but then you know all descriptions. I'll make certain of it, interrupted Fix. The servant seems to me less mysterious than the master. Excuse me for a little while, consul. Fix started off in search of Passepartout. Meanwhile, Mr. Fogg, after leaving the consulate, repaired to the quay, gave some orders to Passepartout, went off to the Mongolia in a boat, and descended to his cabin. He took up his notebook, which contained the following memoranda. Left London, Wednesday, October the 2nd, at 8.45 p.m. Reached Paris, Thursday, October the 3rd, at 7.20 a.m. Left Paris, Thursday, at 8.40 a.m. Reached Turin by Montchigny, Friday, October the 4th, at 6.35 a.m. Left Turin Friday at 7.20 a.m. Arrived at Brindisi, Saturday, October the 5th at 4 p.m. Sailed on the Mongolia Saturday at 5 p.m. Reached Suez Wednesday, October the 9th at 11 a.m. Total of hours spent, 158 and a half. Or in days, six days and a half. These dates were inscribed in an itinerary divided into columns, indicating the month, the day of the month, and the day for the stipulated and actual arrivals at each principal point. Paris, Brundisi, Suez, Bombay, Calcutta, Singapore, Hong Kong, Yokohama, San Francisco, New York, and London, from the 2nd of October to the 21st of December. Phileas Fogg sat down quietly to breakfast in his cabin, never once thinking of inspecting the town, being one of those Englishmen who are wont to see foreign countries, through the eyes of their domestics. Fix soon rejoined Passepartout, who was lounging and looking about on the quay. Well, my friend, said the detective, coming up with him, is your passport visaed? Ah, it's you, is it, monsieur? responded Passepartout. Uh, thanks, yes, the passport is all right. And uh, you are looking about you? Yes, but we travel so fast that I seem to be journeying in a dream. <laughs> So, this is Suez. Yes. In Egypt. Uh, certainly. In Egypt. <laughs> Just think, monsieur. I had no idea that we should go farther than Paris. And all that I saw of Paris was between 20 minutes past seven and 20 minutes before nine in the morning, between the northern and the Lyon station. You are in a great hurry, then? I am not, but my master is. Uh, by the way, I must buy some shoes and shirts. I will show you an excellent shop for getting what you want. Ah, really, monsieur, you are very kind. And they walked off together, Passepartout chatting volubly as they went along. Above all, said he, don't let me lose the steamer. Oh, you have plenty of time. It's only twelve o'clock. Passepartout pulled out his big watch. Twelve? he exclaimed. Why, it's only eight minutes before ten. Your watch is slow. My watch? A family watch, monsieur, which has come down from my great-grandfather. It does not vary five minutes in the year. Uh, I see how it is. You have kept London time, which is two hours behind that of Suez. You ought to regulate your watch at noon in each country. I regulate my watch? Never! Well, then, it will not agree with the sun. So much the worse for the sun, monsieur. The sun will be wrong, then. And the worthy fellow returned the watch to its fob with a defiant gesture. After a few minutes' silence, Fix resumed. You left London hastily, then? <laughs> I rather think so. Last Friday at eight o'clock in the evening, Monsieur Fogg came home from his club. And three quarters of an hour afterwards, uh, we were off. But where is your master going? Our way is straight ahead. He is going round the world. Round the world? 
cried Fix. Yes, and in 80 days. He says it is on a wager, but between us, I don't believe a word of it. Ah, oh, Mr. Fogg is a character, is he? I should say he was. Is he rich? Oh, no doubt, uh, for he is carrying an enormous sum in brand new banknotes with him. And you have known your master a long time? Oh, well, no, I uh, uh, entered his service the very day we left London. The effect of these replies upon the already suspicious and excited detective may be imagined. Consul, said Fix, I have no longer any doubt. I have spotted my man. He passes himself off as an odd stick who is going round the world in eighty days. Then he's a sharp fellow, returned the consul, and counts on returning to London after putting the police of the two continents off his track. We'll see about that, replied Fix. But are you not mistaken? I am not mistaken. Why was this robber so anxious to prove by the visa that he'd passed through Suez? Why? I have no idea, but listen to me. He reported in a few words the most important parts of his conversation with Passepartout. Oh, in short, said the consul, appearances are wholly against this man. And what are you going to do? Send a dispatch to London for a warrant of arrest to be dispatched instantly to Bombay. Take passage on board the Mongolia, follow my rogue to India, and, on English ground, arrest him politely, with my warrant in my hand, and my hand on his shoulder. A quarter of an hour later found Fix, with a small bag in his hand, proceeding on board the Mongolia. And ere many moments longer, the noble steamer rode out at full steam upon the waters of the Red Sea. The distance between Suez and Aden is precisely 1,310 miles, and the regulations of the company allow the steamers 138 hours in which to traverse it. The Mongolia, thanks to the vigorous exertions of the engineer, seemed likely, so rapid was her speed, to reach her destination considerably within that time. But the Red Sea is full of caprice, and often boisterous, like most long and narrow gulfs. When the wind came from the African or Asian coast, the Mongolia, with her long hull, rolled fearfully. Then the ladies speedily disappeared below. The pianos were silent. Singing and dancing suddenly ceased. And what was Phileas Fogg doing all this time? It might be thought that, in his anxiety, he would be constantly watching the changes of the wind, the disorderly raging of the billows. But the same impassable member of the Reform Club, whom no incident could surprise, passed through the memorable scenes of the Red Sea with cold indifference. He made his four hearty meals every day, regardless of the most persistent rolling and pitching on the part of the steamer, and he played whist indefatigably, for he had found partners as enthusiastic in the game as himself. A tax collector on the way to his post at Goa, the Reverend Decimus Smith, returning to his parish at Bombay, and a brigadier-general of the English army, who was about to rejoin his brigade at Benares, made up the party. As for Passepartout, he too had escaped seasickness, and took his meals conscientiously in the forward cabin. He rather enjoyed the voyage, and he was pleased on the day after leaving Suez to find on deck the obliging person with whom he had walked and chatted on the quays, and Passepartout and Fix got into the habit of chatting together. The latter making it a point to gain the worthy man's confidence. Meanwhile, the Mongolia was pushing forward rapidly, and instead of reaching Aden on the morning of the 15th when she was due, arrived there on the evening of the 14th, a gain of 15 hours. Mr. Fogg and his servant went ashore at Aden to have the passport again visaed. Fix, unobserved, followed them. The visa procured, Mr. Fogg returned on board to resume his former habits. The Mongolia had 168 hours in which to reach Bombay. On Sunday, October the 20th, towards noon, they came in sight of the Indian coast, and at half-past four the steamer hauled up at the quays. The Mongolia was due at Bombay on the 22nd. She arrived on the 20th. This was a gain to Phileas Fogg of two days since his departure from London, and he calmly entered the fact in the itinerary in the column of gains. 
Formerly, one was obliged to travel in India by the old cumbrous methods of going on foot or on horseback, in palanquins or unwieldy coaches. Now, fast steamboats ply on the Indus and the Ganges, and a great railway, with branch lines joining the main line at many points on its route, traverses the peninsula from Bombay to Calcutta in three days. This railway does not run in a direct line across India. The distance between Bombay and Calcutta as the bird flies is only from 1,000 to 1,100 miles. But the deflections of the road increase this distance by more than a third. The passengers of the Mongolia went ashore at half past 4 p.m. At exactly 8, the train would start for Calcutta. Mr. Fogg, after bidding goodbye to his whist partners, left the steamer and directed his steps to the passport office. As for the wonders of Bombay, its famous city hall, its splendid library, its forts and docks, its bazaars, mosques, synagogues, its Armenian churches, and the noble pagoda on Malabar Hill with its two polygonal towers, he cared not a straw to see them. Having transacted his business at the passport office, Phileas Fogg repaired quietly to the railway station where he ordered dinner. Fix had gone on shore shortly after Mr. Fogg, and his first destination was the headquarters of the Bombay police. He made himself known as a London detective, told his business at Bombay and the position of affairs relative to the supposed robber, and nervously asked if a warrant had arrived from London. It had not reached the office. Fix was sorely disappointed, and tried to obtain an order of arrest from the director of the Bombay police. This the director refused, as the matter concerned the London office. Fix was fain to resign himself to await the arrival of the important document. But he was determined not to lose sight of the mysterious rogue as long as he stayed in Bombay. Meanwhile, Passepartout, having purchased the usual quota of shirts and shoes, took a leisurely promenade about the streets, where crowds of people of many nationalities, Europeans, Persians with pointed caps, banyars with round turbans, Sins with square bonnets, Parsees with black mitres and long-robed Armenians were collected. It happened to be the day of a Parsee festival. In the midst, Indian dancing girls, clothed in rose-coloured gauze, looped up with gold and silver, danced airily, but with perfect modesty, to the sound of viols and the clanging of tambourines. It is needless to say that Passepartout watched these with staring eyes and gaping mouth. Unhappily for his master, as well as himself, his curiosity drew him unconsciously farther off than he intended to go. At last, having seen the Parsi carnival wind away in the distance, he was turning his step towards the station when he happened to espy the splendid pagoda on Malabar Hill and was seized with an irresistible desire to see its interior. He was quite ignorant that it is forbidden to Christians to enter certain Indian temples, and that even the faithful must not go in without first leaving their shoes outside the door. It may be said here that the wise policy of the British government severely punishes a disregard of the practices of the native religions. Passepartout, however, thinking no harm, went in like a simple tourist, and was soon lost in admiration of the splendid Brahmin ornamentation which everywhere met his eyes, when of a sudden he found himself sprawling on the sacred flagging, he looked up to behold three enraged priests, who forthwith fell upon him, tore off his shoes, and began to beat him with loud, savage exclamations. The agile Frenchman was soon upon his feet again, and lost no time in knocking down two of his long-gowned adversaries with his fists. At five minutes before eight, Passepartout, hatless, shoeless, and having in the squabble lost his package of shirts and shoes, rushed breathlessly into the station. Fix, who had followed Mr. Fogg to the station and saw that he was really going to leave Bombay, was there upon the platform. Passepartout did not observe the detective, who stood in an obscure corner, but Fix heard him relate his adventures in a few words to Mr. Fogg. I hope that this will not happen again, said Phileas Fogg coldly as he got into the train. Poor Passepartout. Fix was on the point of entering another carriage when an idea struck him which induced him to alter his plan. No, I'll stay, 
he muttered. An offence has been committed on Indian soil. <laughs> I've got my men! End of side one.